Yes. Amen. All right, so what you see before you is my illustration of what the world will do to us if we don't pray. It'll make us hard. That's pretty hard. How many's ever had a hard sponge, you know? But what's a sponge for? It's for to soak up the water and to get clean, right? Now, God wants us like sponges. But you got to understand, we could be soaking up something more other than God. Let me say other than God. All right? So we don't want to be hanging around those people that haven't got anything good to say to us. Because whether we know it or not, we'll get on us and we'll have some form of effect to us. So that's why God wants us filled with him, filled with his presence, so that that stuff makes no inroad to, of the enemy in our lives. Can you say amen? Now, folks, I believe God's got us protected. Why would God know that we're in a fallen planet with a fallen outlaw? Why would God just put us here and leave us like a baby for the wolves? Never. When you got saved, or excuse me, when you got born, God put a hedge around you. When you got old enough to know right and wrong, you lost that hedge. You had to become born again. Once you became born again and you confessed with your mouth and believed that Jesus is Lord, you become saved. God puts another hedge around you. Now, it's up to us to learn how to talk, learn how to walk, so we don't rip down that protective hedge that God's got around us. Remember Lucifer, Satan, when he came in with the angels to present themselves. He's, and, and God says... Have you seen my servant Job? Because God knew he was trying to get to Job. But Satan doesn't know until you flag him what you got open for him to come in on. It's our big mouth that keeps telling him where to attack. Look at your neighbor and say, woo. -oo. Now, don't get mad at me. We all have a big mouth. But you have two ears and one mouth. That's the ratio. My dad used to say to me, son, when we go visit these people, they're very wealthy, very influential. I want you to just be quiet and smile a lot. If nothing else, I'll think you're smart and you won't open your mouth and remove all doubt. He actually said that to me. And that's exactly how we tip the enemy off, by how we talk. John the Baptist was questioned by the religious people in the beginning. They came out, the religious people, and they remember they said to John, who are you and what are you saying about yourself? Let me say that to you. Who are you and how are you talking about yourself? And what I mean by that is, are you a man of faith, a woman of faith? Are you saying, oh, I'm just a dumb idiot, blah, 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 blah. You have two fountains that come out of this little thing here. Shut the negative one down. All right. So through the world, situations, everything have a tendency to harden our heart. Remember Pharaoh? He would not let God's people go. And it says God hardened his heart. Actually, the translation is Pharaoh's rebellious attitude hardened his heart and God judged him with a hard heart. And we know all the plagues that came along. But God doesn't want us to have a hardened heart, does he? So to keep us fresh, we need to expose you to God. So how many has ever felt like this? Come on. Learn to be with God. Now, it takes a little time. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We just get involved. And it just... See, but your mind's going to interrupt you during that soaking up situation. So you need to cast down those imaginations. How many times have you been praying and just being in the presence of God and your mind told you 30 things you should be doing? You didn't do this. You didn't do that. You got to go, go do this. Why? To get you up and get you away from God so you don't just become fresh and full of his presence. Fresh and full of his presence. Now, I don't know about you. I like to be soaked. I like to have God's presence all over me. In fact, I feel like there's something missing when I don't sense or be aware of him. 
Are you ready to get in a lesson? Now, what happens to a lot of Christians? Remember when before we were saved, we were capped off. There's a space for God in here. We were capped off. But see, if you don't have a, a real good prayer life every day, seeking and presenting yourself to God, he, we there's a crust. The old flesh caps us off again. It wants to take over, wants to run. Oh, no, oh, no. We want to bring things that we experienced in the past to control our present, leaving God out. Not a very good thing to do. How many here are learning there's a, a higher walk? Good. Thank you for your prayers, because that's what I want to give to you. Not because I discovered it. It's because God revealed these things for me to me so I can give them to you. Sounds like almost the book of Revelation. God revealed them to John, his servant, so he could give them the revelations away to the church. Can you say amen? So what I have isn't for me, it's for everybody. A series called New Creation Realities. I'm going to try to stay behind the pulpit as much as possible in case my, my pants go down to the knees, you know, and for God forbid. Amen. So greetings to you, church family. Today we're going to impart some revelation knowledge on the power of God through the intercessory prayer. So we're going to call this God's power in intercession. Say amen, somebody. To intercede is to ask God or to invite him and his intervention power into people's lives, places, into different things, ministries, different things you're doing unto God, to birth the plan of God into existence and into areas where the people don't know where to ask. Did you know that you might have relatives that don't know to ask Jesus into their heart? How are they going to know if you don't pray for them? You have the power right there in your own living room, wherever you like to pray, to change and frame the world around you, your family, everything. That's why the enemy tries to keep your mind so active and so scattered so that we cannot focus. You have in, in, uh, literal bombs in your hands. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for uh, uh, Russia and all the leadership there that are communism, and I lodge a bomb of prayer over on them. And I ask you to explode, suddenly make their minds come clear to understand there is a God. You see, you can be creative with your prayers, and they're like bombs. They're like a, a sharpshooter. Can you say amen? Listen, a lot of Christians, they pray like they're blind. Let me give you an illustration. Just tell me where to shoot, and they end up shooting each other. I don't like what Peggy's doing. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Let's just go to say some negative things. So your words are like bullets. Your words are like bombs. And the more you can frame your words by faith unto God, the more power God fills them with. And they become the very capsules of, their, of people's salvation. Say amen. Not only that, but the type of prayer that we're going to discuss is the most wonderful expression of God's love and his mercy towards others. Here's the thing that I want to share with you. This is standing in the gap for other people. Folks, people need to stand for other people. We need to carry one another's burdens. But how can we do that, Pastor Kerry? I got enough of my own. Let me ask you, why are you carrying your burdens around? You're supposed to give them to God. You're supposed to say, Lord, that's bothering my mind. That's bothering me. I take that in Jesus' name and I cast it over on you. And I refuse to allow it to dwell in my head. Can you do that? Say amen. Don't let anything that isn't of God dwell and ring around in your head. 
Look at if you dwell on people on people in a negative way a lot, you'll formulate an opinion. Go back to the judgment. For example, I'll use Peggy because she's most innocent in here. No, <laughs> you all are. I'll use you, Peggy, because I have more. Let's say Peggy thinks I'm I'm getting on her case, okay? I'm going to use me and Peggy. Peggy thinks I'm getting on her case. So that's what she thinks. Actually, I'm not. I'm just trying to help her life. But as long as she thinks that I am doing this, how is she going to respond? Always the way she thinks it is. So the devil knows that. He comes in and he lays out something. And so we think it's that way. And we start reacting to it. Did God ask you to do that? No. You're meddling. Say, homie. Did you get that? Did you see the clear picture of that? So if I, if I think my congregation is a certain way, then I'm going to respond to you a certain way. But what if the congregation isn't that way at all? Then I've made the mistake of judging. So now I'm going to be judged on the same measure that I judge. So guess what? We want to be filled with love in the spirit so that love thinketh no negatives about anyone, even though there are plenty. And I'll tell you one thing I share with Sherry and, and with our Bible study on Wednesday. Oh, if you can make it, just make it. It's so full of God. But one thing I taught them was we know no man after the flesh. The Bible says we know no man after the flesh, even though we have known the Lord in the flesh, we don't know him that way anymore. We know him after the spirit. Our job is not to know each other by the things we do wrong or by our simpleness. This is why it's hard for me to just befriend everybody. Because some people think friendship means I'm going to take advantage of you and get what I can get out of you. And that's not friendship. So I am careful who I choose to bring into my life. If you ask me to be a friend, you will be my friend. But there's boundaries. Don't trespass. In the leadership of the church, do not make decisions above your pastors and your leaders because whether you know it or not, you're doing witchcraft. Hello? That's called the spirit of Jezebel or usurping authority over authorities. Don't do that. Follow the line of God's section. Say amen. amen. I don't go into your house, open your fridge, and eat your food and forget to tell you that I'm coming. People do that in church. Don't do that. Don't pick up anything and start doing stuff unless you first talk to the people who might want it done or not want it done. I had a guy come in here one time, taped all the rugs down. I didn't want it done. I was on vacation. Who told him to do that? Now I've got stains all over my rugs. You see, sometimes we take matters in our own hands. Let's just flow with God. Say amen. All right, let's look at our scripture. Power of intercession. Okay, and the Lord said to Simon, who's Simon? This is Peter, okay? Simon was his surname, which means little pebble. Everyone say little pebble. Little pebble. Because who's the big rock? Jesus, okay? And the Lord said to Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that ye may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed the prayer for you. See, this is intercession. That your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, see, he was going to go away and return, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Was Peter ready? Not at all. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you even know me. Woo. See, that's the flesh of man. We're afraid for ourselves. We want to protect our stuff. But God says, if you seek to save your life, you will lose it. But if you seek to lose your life or give it unto me, I will save your life. Say amen. Remember, the big plan is God sending his son to rescue every bit of every human being that would cry out to him. Everyone. So, let's say I end up dying of a good old age. Ooh, hallelujah. 
what happens when I die? I leave the planet. It's a rescue. So God's got you so covered that if I walk, I'm going to use me so you don't feel, if I walk out here and something happens, somebody hits me or shoots me and I die instantly, it's graduation day. You see, you got to have a different mindset. We're only here to win other people to God. Yes, we need to make a living. Yes, we need to do certain things. But if all you do is try to exist and try to live for yourself, you won't have a dime reward. Because it's not your own righteousness. It's you are living God out in the world. Say amen. So natural people don't know how to follow God. It's foolishness to them. So they try to go to church, and they're trying to do this, and they're trying to do that, but they're doing it naturally. We need to do it from the spirit man. Say amen. I like to say from the core or bowels of mercy. Everyone says, I don't understand that. What does that mean? Well, in a tree, everyone say tree. Tree has a core. There's a little round thing in the center, you know, where it's the core, the heart of that tree. Well, you have a core. That's your spirit man. It's the heart of your very being where God now lives. See? And you'll hear people in, in physical therapy and, and, and exercise, yes, you got to bring it to the core, you know. <laughs> They're stealing it from God. God lives in the core of your being. He's in the very depths of your heart. We need to let him out and exercise our walk with him. Say amen. We're going to cover these four things. Did I finish all the scripture? Okay. Cover these four things. Everyone say okay. okay. All right. Jesus, number one, is our model for intercession. He's the first intercessor we see. I'll show you that. Two, intercession is our covenant display of love. So you have a covenant that cannot be broken. Old Testament, bless it. I love the Bible. I love the Old Testament. I love to learn. Those people had it tough. And it was their faith in God that got them out. But in the New Testament, God leads us out. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He leadeth me. He leadeth me. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's the earth. Not your hard times. I was taught in Bible school that the shadow of death are those negative hard times you go through. In the valley. I love to ham it up on that. No, it's the earth. The earth is a fallen planet. It is full of the devil. And you're walking in it. So keep the armor on, keep your full light, keep full of the word, and start kicking booty. That's who you are. You're the rulers in the planet, not the devil anymore. He's been stripped. So start ruling. Someone say, oh me. Where's the church been? Go back 20 years church was vibrant fast forward till now people are hiding in foxholes fighting amongst themselves they're not being obedient to God's call to prayer I bet you if I go out in some of these large churches and I interview people and ask them how their prayer life is what do you think I would hear now I just be be merciful you would hear things you don't want to hear if they're honest. The problem is, is the devil knows where your walk is. He monitors you. He runs scenarios on you. You know, he does a, a rhythm on your habits. So if you don't walk in the light, he's going to pick you off somewhere. Okay? And we don't want that. Everyone says, I don't want that. So I meet with God. We, we talk with God. We get covered with God. We walk with God. And then when we go places, he moves out of the way because God's leading us. If God's leading us, who's going to get in the way of God? Now, if you're leading yourself, you're going to have opposition. In the world, you will have tribulation. But fear not, little flock. I have overcome the world. How many here are in Christ? 
That means you overcome the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faiths. The third thing we'll cover is binding and loosing how to do it properly. You have the power to bind and the power to release, loose. And then fourthly, purpose, the purpose of the armor. So let's get in it. I'll try to go real quick. Are you hungry? Remember the Holy Spirit monitors, monitors your hunger for the word. So if you're preoccupied, your mind's somewhere else, you won't get anything. Focus, focus, focus. Make yourself focus. You know, when I'm looking at something in school, I took out a focus glass, a magnifying glass, and I begin to look. Focus. Okay, got it? Focus. Let's get those glasses of Jesus on. Okay, so Jesus, our mode of intercession, our model. Ezekiel 22, please. Look at verse 30. This is Jesus, our model for intercession. Now, I want to let you know that human beings are very selfish at times. And then and in this situation, God looked for someone to pray. Remember the friend at midnight? And you're going to see what happened here. 22 verse 30, Ezekiel. And it says, So I looked for a man among them who would make a, a, a wall, or a hedge, stand in the gap before me. And on the behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. He's saying there's a time nobody even cared. Nehemiah's time, Jeremiah was known as a weeping prophet because the kingdom was divided into Judah and divided into, into Israel, and they weren't getting along. What does Satan love? He loves opposition. He loves for you to turn your face against somebody and argue and be in opposition because then he sucks the energy out of both of you, and you become the dummies. Arguing, fighting is all selfish. Be quiet, say I'm wrong, be humble. Why? It cuts Satan's power. Oh yeah, I can rail on the government. I can rail on some of these people. I gotta watch not calling names. But to rail itself is a tool Satan uses to attack me. So even I might feel justified by railing on a problem, the act of me railing is fleshly and opens the door. I'm speaking to you. So don't rail on things that you know God already knows. Pray on them. Say, oh me. Isaiah 50 through 6 tells what Jesus actually did. Now, this is the scripture that tells us he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. Then it goes down farther, and he says in verse 6, All of we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. See the intercession? Jesus died in our place. He stood in the gap. I looked for a man that would stand in the gap, and I found none who became a man. And the word was made flesh. And the, hello? And that was Jesus. And it dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the only begotten, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. This is John 1. And it says, in him was life. Everyone say life. life. And the life was the light of men. Think of that. You got born again. What's sitting in your spirit? Light. And you have the ability to open it up and blast Satan between the eyes with a little laser beam. Did you know that? Of course you don't. I'm here to tell you. God has been showing me things. Thank you for your prayers. There are things that we have been hidden from us that we can now use and open up to because if we don't know they're there, then we won't know to use them. But if we do know they're there and we know that we can use them and God will help us to use them, then we can have the victory that God said we have. I'm preaching myself happy. 
So it says, we all like sheep gone astray. So Jesus took our place, didn't he? Second Corinthians 5.21 tells us what he actually did. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, for he made him, the father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin, not to take sin, but to be sin. Oh, that's a heavy, we won't, I can't stop there, it's too much, but we'll try to explain that. To be sin for us, that we might become, become, that means we have the ability to become the righteousness of God. Now, when you ask Jesus in your heart, forgiveness of your sin, God comes in and you become righteous. Not in yourself, because only because you have the righteous one in you. Say righteous one. He lives in me. Okay. That's why you're righteous. Not by anything you do. Next time you get a great answer to prayer, don't take the credit. Hey, Sherry, your life is going good because I pray for you every day. How do you think God's going to take that? Not very good, but I do pray for all of you. But I don't want any credit for it. I just want God to bless you. Bring you closer to him. Open up the windows of heaven. Help you understand that relationship. Stop m becoming religious and becoming just totally into God. That's what I pray for you. Your family, your children, if you have some. Your mom, dad, sisters, and brothers. Every day we, we bombard you with that kind of prayer. And I would appreciate it if you would pray for us that way. And some of you do. Let's go on. So Jesus paid the price for us in full, for our salvation, our completeness, and it's an ongoing work that's working right with us right up to this very moment. Number two, Jesus became sin to free us so that we could have the liberty of his kingdom. Say amen. We, folks, listen to this. We are to reign in life. We're to flourish. Now, how does that happen? You don't do it. That's why it's so hard for you to get ahead. Stop and say, God, take over now. Run the business, run my driving, run my, my work, and let me follow you or lead. That doesn't mean you don't use your brain. It means your brain's not in the way. God's brain is working. You try to get a heavenly mind. Say amen. amen. I know someone, worst thing you can do is complain on the job. Some people are just mean. So if you're on the job, be wise as serpents and gentle as dove. You know, I, one person you know, would go and deliver something, and then the person says, well, how's it going? And then they complain about their employer. Dumb, 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 dumb. Don't you complain to anybody. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says complainers get serpents. That's the Old Testament. What you get is more trials that bite at you. Everyone say, I got it. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, amen. You're the blessed ones. But we have to be wise to apply the proper principles. Say amen. Thirdly, where is Jesus now, folks? Tell me. He lives in your heart, and he's at the right hand of the Father. Can you say amen? And the Bible says, in the spirit realm, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So you're actually seated, sealed, covered, washed, and protected until you open your mouth and start speaking your old life. Then the enemy picks up, oh, that's Kerry. Just look at him. I know how to get him irritated. Don't you think enemy does that? Yeah, you better know. Listen, you're so protected, though. It doesn't take very much effort to maintain that edge over everything because God is your edge. You're thinking, 
Well, you know, if, if this was so, I wouldn't be going through trials and everything. The reason, now listen, is your eyes are on the world and on yourself. That's why you're going through trials. My wife said one time she prayed for God to deliver her about something with her children. But when she prayed that prayer, she noticed her kids seemed to act more weird. And God spoke up and says, they're not acting any more weird. I just opened your eyes to see what actually was going on. And God is opening the church's eyes now, folks. And we prophesy. In this day, saith the Lord, I am opening those that are obedient to me and come to me. I am opening their eyes. Just like my servant, I opened his eyes and he saw there are more with them than there are with the enemy. Therefore, know who you are, saith God. Know what I have done for you. And even now, even now, I sit at the right hand of the Father and I make intercession for you. I stand for you. I back you. I lift my covenant up. Therefore, do not doubt. Do not question me no more. Stand up and obey my word and watch the victory and the power of God manifest. Let's give God praise. Amen. All right, so let's go to the next point here. Keep within your hedge, folks. Everyone remember the hedge teaching? Keep within your hedge. Don't be a big shot. Thinking you're all that, jump outside of the hedge and get the tar beat out of you. And then blame it on God. Oh, God, why did this happen? God says, because you leaped out in front of me and you didn't pray about it. Now, you, most Christians don't want to hear an answer like that, so they shut their mind down. And they, they have this thing they say. I, you know, I've never heard God's voice. If you're a Christian and never heard God's voice, you're not close enough to God. So don't look at me in that tone. I've heard God's voice when I first got saved because nobody told me I couldn't. But a lot of us have different backgrounds, a lot of different static stuff going on. You can hear God's voice and just one word from God in the morning will make your entire day. By acting on it, you're not acting on yourself. You're acting on what God said. So it is God who doeth the work. Amen? God who does the work, not you. Put them out there in front. Doesn't matter what you are. Are you a janitor? Janitor for God. You truck driver like I was? Truck drive for God and win souls along the way if God allows you to. But get your eyes off yourself and your family because that's a curse. Why? Because you don't want your family being protected by you alone. You want God help. <laughs> Which means we can sleep at night and enjoy God in the morning. All right, so let's get into this. You haven't got into this yet? All right. So Romans 8. I just unbuckled part of my pants here. I'm going to have to be careful. Romans chapter 8, look at this, verse 31 through 39. I'm going to read rather quickly. But remember your covenant. Remember that you're now going to give up the time to intercede properly. It says, what shall we say then to these things that attack us, to come against us? God, if God be for us, who can be against us? 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he, how shall he not with him? Everyone say with him. Freely give us what? Say I have all things. I have all things that pertain to life and godliness. Okay? I have all things that pertain to life and godliness already inside of me. That's why God does not like you going, God, help me. God, bring your power now. Bring your power now. Hey, it's in you. Oh, 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 oh. See, and we need sometimes to really go, you know, I'm glad I'm not in charge. We really need to say, I, I'm glad I'm not in charge, Linda. That way... I know I could, it's just much better, say amen. So listen to what Exodus says. And this is Paul writing. He had a tough time, remember? He wasn't a namby-pamby guy. Okay, look, 
He freely gives us all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? That's Satan that does that. It is God who justifies us. We belong to him. We're none of Satan or anybody else's business. Say amen. amen. Who is he who condemns? Satan is the one who condemns, not God. It is Christ who died, and furthermore, who is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes what for us? Intercession. God, nobody else prays for you. Jesus is praying for you. Then when you say, Father, in Jesus' name, now two of you are in agreement. You can get some more people. Now you're moving mountains. Because heaven's always in prayer for you. Hello? Hello? Remember the rescue program? The only reason God is in this dirty earth is to get his kids. Now you need to start winning souls and pushing them towards the Lord. Stop thinking about, oh, getting your needs met. Listen, if you get people saved, your needs will be so met. Because you're sowing and reaping the pop proper stuff. But see, what the enemy does is he gets us to self-focus. If I become better, maybe more faithful, God will use me more. There you go thinking again. Your own understanding is dangerous. What is our own understanding? That's taking what we have learned from the past, forgetting things which are behind, taking what we've learned in the past, bringing it up and analyzing things by it. Now, if you had a bad life, your analyzation is warped. You need to renew your mind so you can see things the way God has things set up and not try to lean to your own understanding, which is a collection of memories and information that you haven't figured all out why it's there. Just a bunch of computer stuff in there. Come on now. You know I'm speaking the truth. So don't lean to that. You lean to God inside your spirit. You go to him, you talk with him, say, God, bring the eyes of my understanding. Wake me up, God. Say amen. amen. Then it goes on. It's, and it says what ministers are. This next phrase is talking about ministers. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. Distress? No. Persecution? Famine? Nakedness? Or peril? Or sword? As it is written, this is talking about ministers. And this is a quote from the Old Testament. For your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. You see... I'm pouring my heart out. Do you think Satan likes that? Please keep us in prayer. Because if he takes me out, what are you going to do? You'll have to find another church, go through all the rigmar. So you better be praying for your leadership. Stop cursing them. What would you have for lunch, pastor? Now, you know, I'm teasing with you. But I want to tell you, we lost a good minister that I trained five years I won't mention his name. He was a great minister, loved to play the guitar, but his congregation killed him because they put so much pressure on him, didn't give him enough help. He died early. He wasn't supposed to go. He's younger than I am. The congregation will draw and draw and draw from their ministers, but they won't give to the congregation. They won't help build the church. They won't do all that. They just suck, 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 and they kill them. And they've killed many, many. In the Old Testament, he said, you've killed the prophets and the priests because you didn't like what they said. In this case, they just loved them so much, they put them on a path. In fact, you talk to some of their disciples, and they're, ah, 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 ah. We're not to deify your ministers. Okay. You want me to be as accurate as I can be, but I'm just a donkey delivering a message. I don't strut my stuff around. I don't drive fancy stuff around. But I am pouring my heart out daily for your sake. Amen. Now you understand what that scripture is about. Paul says, I die daily that you may live. 
And he goes on further. Said, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, that's Satan, and the powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of, that's in God in Christ Jesus. Say amen. Now, if you have your eyes on me and I make a mistake, will that stumble you and make you go away from God? Then you got me too high on the, on the list. I, I, one, of my, one of my old ministers, I loved him. He was so old, though, when I was ministering. His name was Oral Roberts. I don't know if you know who Oral Roberts is. So I got to minister for a week with, alongside of him and Dr. Youngie Cho and a lot, a lot of good ministers like Ken, uh, uh, Jerry Seville and a few people. We were down at a convention. I was just going to the convention. But they sat me next to Oral Roberts and Dr. Cho. And, you know, he's just a normal man. He says, son, you got to remember one thing. You're going to make mistakes. The mistakes don't make you. It's your getting up from them. He says, and remember something else. You're not living for yourself. You're living for the Lord. You begin to live in the Father's house with many mansions. Right now, you're a soldier, and God's got a special mission for it. Find out what that is, and get after it, and you'll never be so blessed in your entire life. That's what he told me. I said, okay, okay, just a little kid, you know, okay, amen. Intercession is our covenant expression of love. That's my next point. First Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 6 says, Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all goodness and godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants everybody saved, doesn't he? Now, is everybody going to get saved? No, because you have to make a choice. But God wants everybody saved. So we go after them just like that. Does God want everybody healed? Yes. Does everybody get healed? No. Because you have to have faith in the God to heal you. Amen. And a lot of people's heads talk them out of it. All right. So say amen. So let's look at this. Then it goes, says, whoever desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Now look at verse 5. For there is one God. How many? And one mediator between God and man, the man, notice it says, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified in due time. I'm going to take some cereal here. I think definitely I'm going to get some suspenders. Just to try it out. A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, knowing our covenant with God, God's backing that covenant. It is our power source. It isn't our power, but it's God's power source. We tap into it by faith. Can you say amen? Two, the covenant is given to us in Jesus Christ. It's our faith that makes that contact. All the provisions of the kingdom are given to us in Christ. Can you say amen? The key, though, is for us to be aware of these things so we can have faith for them. If you're not aware you can walk in victory every day, then you won't have faith for that. If some pastor will tell you, well, you never know. What God's going to do, you're going to go through the mud and the crud. So he's talking about the earthly plane. He's not talking about the spiritual end. We have a lot of ministers speaking psychology and earthly plane stuff. Do this, do that, do that, and you'll get this. Now, without God, you won't. They leave the God part out, having a form of godliness, but denying the God part, the God power. Don't deny God's power in you. Let him have his way. Say, O oh, me. 
the statement Jesus said, in that day you shall ask the Father in my name, and he shall give it to you, shows the covenant. Didn't say, ah, I'll have to make up my mind whether to answer you or not. No, if you ask in Jesus' name, it's granted. Now think about it. There's an outlaw down here that's wagging its ugly face towards God and all his little hordes. And they're saying, nah, 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 your people don't believe you. Your people don't walk with you. Your people are just religious. They're all doing their own thing and, and mentioning them, blah, 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 blah. That's what the enemy's saying. God just loves to bless everyone right in the statement of that. While he's wagging his tail, you're getting blessed. Hello, because you refuse to enter in that physical realm and allow it to dictate to you. You refuse to let your mind wander, but you rather control that computer and you have it play the godly things to you. And you follow through by asking God to crucify your flesh and make you a living new creation in Christ. It's a daily thing, folks. It's a daily thing. I don't know about you, but I'm better than I was yesterday. And my wife says I was pretty good. I'm just joking. But you know what I mean? We should be getting better. Right? Sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Amen? And with that in mind, God's going to surround you, love you, coddle you. He's going to help you understand that it's you been giving your own self the problems. You've been doing it, and you need to admit, Adam, that it wasn't the woman nor God. It was you, Bunky. When you get to a point where you talk to God, Lord, it was me, and I really blew it, and I'm sorry. God loves it. Because you're bringing him truth, not trying to hide or coddle something. Now, remember this. This is a good one for you. I learned this in Bible college. What we choose to hide, God will uncover and expose. But what we expose to God in prayer, he will cover and hide. In other words, he will hide your faults. And other people will see your goodness. Let me say it again. If you hide your faults, God will expose them. But if you go to God and expose your faults, Lord, I, I need help. God will cover them. Love covers a multitude of sin. There you go. Say, I got that. That's good. That's good. So stop pointing out everybody else's faults. Moving right along. Knowing our covenant, this God's backing it, we are covered. Now, I want you to go with James chapter 5, please. Look at 13 through 16. On the same point, intercession is our covenant displayed in love. James chapter 5, 13 through 16. This is the prayer of faith. I shared this with Pauline the other day. As God, Pauline, what did God do with your ears? Stand up and Tell everybody, what do you do? God healed my ears yesterday. I, I Friday on the, on the women's ministry. I know yesterday's gone. Ah! I just whacked my own microphone. I'm going to try to get one that fits a little better. Uh, and it has a little pin on my collar, and I'm not sitting on and pulling off my face. You know, it looks like a, a real professional here. Yeah, uh-huh. Amen. Something that's gone. Now, if... It, look what it says. This is James, Jesus' brother. Is any among you suffering? What should you do? Let him pray. The word pray there means supplicate, worship, and love on God. If you're suffering, focus on God. Love on God. Let him heal you. Say amen. amen. These are our steps. So look at the next step. If anyone is cheerful, yee I am. A whole bunch of, of you are. Let him sing psalms, praise. 
In other words, you're never going to hear Pastor Kerry say, settle down, you're just too excited. No, I'm going to encourage you, and you be patient. Somebody's excited for the Lord, you want to encourage that excitement, because nobody follows the hearse. It's fire trucks. It's noises. Hello. I can't wait till we see all the pews filled and people are shouting for God in here. I have to go to two services and they're parking down the street and up the street. What are you believing for? Amen. If any man is suffering, anyone pray, anyone cheerful, let him sing psalms. Am any among you sick? Do what? Let him call for the elders of the church. Who am I? Who is my wife? You sick? Call for us. Hey. Now, I want to tell you, now please listen very, very sensitively. This is the way in which half the church gets healed. Because if it wasn't for medicine and doctors, the church would be dead. Because they can't believe for anything. So God put this clause in here for people who don't hardly have any faith. All they need to do is feel a little touchy-touchy and a collie collie for the elder elders, And they come pray, pray, pray. And you don't have to have any faith at all. God just does it. You need to know that. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm just trying to tell you that. So if you've tried everything else, try giving me a call. Or my wife, or somebody that's an elder. So what is an elder? Well, there's two kinds. Elder means older. There are Christian elders, but then there are Christian elders of the church. Now, the elders of the church means they've been there the longest, and God ordained them to be the leaders there. Not, not I didn't ordain myself. So there's an anointing on the corporate of church and the, the ministry elders of the church. Hello. Just because it's part of the covenant. So let's continue to read on. Let's see what it says. This is really good, folks. Okay. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them what? Let them pray. Petition, worship over, sing songs, and lay hands on them. Pray over them, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will what? will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and if there be any sins committed he will be forgiven whoa to understand this what did Jesus do he died rose again to forgive us of our sin when you pray for the sick you are praying Jesus on them who forgives sin who heals it's not you you're just the vessel you're like a hose. You're spraying God out on him. Instead of putrid stuff from our own imagination. Lord, you said to lay hands on him. I can't heal a fly, God. But it says that you will save the sick. Heal them, deliver them, make them whole, forgive their sins. Woo! In Jesus' name. Now, who promised that? God did. So do you try to get people healed? You know, I, I stopped trying years ago. I just know when I pray, God's healing comes. Now listen, God's healing comes. Now whether or not the person receives that healing is up to them. Every time I say, Father, in Jesus' name, and you too, the power of God to heal and save comes. Because it's all around you. But when you say, Father, in Jesus' name, it culminates around you and <laughs> sticks to you. Because you just flag God down. Father, in Jesus' name, boom. Okay, what? What? Uh, uh, uh. Where a lot of Christians have been. <laughs> Uh, God, you're so powerful. I don't know what to ask. Why don't you prepare a little before you come to God? Anyway, let's not meddle there too long. Okay. The prayer of binding and loosing. Everyone say binding, binding. So, and loosing. 
Now, I learned this from my pastor right away. He says, son, when you, when you bind something, the angels, now listen carefully, the angels come down and they literally wrap a rope or chain around, this is what my pastor's telling me, around the spirit. So if you say, an unclean spirit, I bind you in the name of Jesus. The angels, because you can't reach to that spirit. The angels just wrap that spirit up, bind him up, chain him up. Then you have to tell him to go somewhere. I don't want to look at a bound up spirit, you know? So you say, I command you in Jesus' name, go into the dry places. You can't command them to go to hell because they come and go from there all the time. You command them to go into the dry places and never return again. Everyone say, never return again. Never return again. Remember, you have the power to bind and to lose. You have power to completely render a spirit ineffective and command it never to return to that person again. What are you doing? Man, Peggy, you know how powerful you are sitting in that spot praying? Yeah, because you direct God. Remember our prayer, two-thirds of our prayer is getting the words out so God can have the invitation to flow. And so I did say you, because you create the opening for God to flow. God does not jump on people and save them. You have to ask God invitation, this is intercession, to go on behalf of them, go on behalf of the situation, and fill that with your presence. Say amen. So binding and releasing, Matthew 16, verse 13 says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea and Philip, I asked the disciples, saying, Who do men around you say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elisha, others say Jeremiah is one of the prophets. See, a lot of them believed in reincarnation. The Jewish people, some of them were in trouble, they believed in reincarnation. I know it's sad to say. So they were, all these people were saying, gosh, it's John the Baptist again. It's Jeremiah the prophet. What do they got their eye on? The law and the prophets, not on Jesus. Goes on further to say, and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? I've been around you for three and a half years, boys. What do you see of me? And here's Simon, bless his heart. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. He just got semi-born again to the future death and resurrection. He just acknowledged Jesus Christ. So that means he's sealed for a future death and resurrection of Christ. So look what he says. He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for first, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say that you are Peter, little pebble. But upon this rock, the revelation of the word of Jesus, I will build my church, and the gates of hell, what? Will not prevail against it. Well, I want to tell you something. As long as I'm in Christ, Satan can't touch you. You can't touch me. But it's us getting out of the umbrella of grace, going out and doing our own thing. Hey, let's go to Fred's bar and party hardy. Now, I want to tell you something. I, I, years and years ago, I had, a whole, I, I had a whole bunch of students in the Lord. And there were a couple of bands traveling around with some Christians in it. But there were secular bands. Some of the Christians decided upon themselves they were just going to go out and hang around and listen to those things. Well, you know what? Every one of them that did that all had problems. Because it says, come out from among them and be separate. Why? So that you can learn God's ways. So that you can go into all the world and bring the message of salvation. Christians, we're supposed to be changing the world, not the world changing us. Say, oh me. Don't look like the world. Don't smell like the world. And certainly don't cuss out of the side of your mouth. 
People will see that and it'll blow your testimony and they'll think you're a hypocrite. Satan will see to it. Yeah, see, don't ever listen to that person. They make mistakes and they're hypocritical. Everybody is. That's why we need Jesus. Say amen. Where aren't our eyes supposed to be on other people? All right, let's go on. So we can bind up the devil. Did you know you can bind up sickness? Cancer has a spiritual part. Cancer is a disease, a rebellion of the cells, but there's a spirit in the person causing the cancer. So you can bind that spirit of cancer. The angels go in, they wrap it all up, and command it to go into the right places and don't return to that person again. Therefore, if they are going through treatment, the treatment will now work. Because the spirit isn't causing the problem. You can't zap with radiation a devil. Come on. You can't medicate a spook. You have to cast it out. Say me. Say ho me, man. I'm done. I am so filled with God. I'm about ready to float out of here. I imagined myself one time that I kept just walking off the stage and I was still in the air. <laughs> what an imagination. Pray for me, Sherry. Amen. Okay, so let's get into this some more. Okay, so the key to binding and loosing, listen, is to have the king inspire that binding and loosing. Jesus lives in you. Say amen. Number two, we are believers in Christ. Only we have the authority to bind and loose. You can't say that. Now listen, you are not supposed to say this. Oh God, bind the devil. Sounds good, doesn't it? Oh Lord, bind the devil in Jesus' name. And God says, I told you to do it. You have the authority. You were born in the earth. You have now my son in your heart. I have already set the enemy, and he's already bound from heaven. Now I'm asking you to use your authority and keep him bound in this planet. Keep him off of your folks. Keep him off of your children. Keep him out of your property. Keep him off of your job and your friends, your children. Can you say amen? And you just simply do that, Lord. I bind everything that's working against my family, and I release your angels to bind it all up. Now I release the grace of God, the goodness, the blessings of God, and you do that every day. And if you're tired of saying those words, put it on a piece of paper, put it on your refrigerator, just slap your hand on it and say, you know what I mean, God, in Jesus' name. He knows. He knows. He wants you to keep the pressure of prayer on. You just keep him on it. You're putting God on things. Keep him on it yes. until it leaves. But if you don't put, it, put something on him, he'll try to wiggle out. He'll try to mess with things. Remember, he, he's rebellious. He's a liar, but he has to obey God. You have God in you. You need to speak God. You need to think God. You need to do that so that your life is free and has all the freedoms in Christ so you can reign in life. See? Oh, yes. So listen, there's a negative side of binding and loosing. Folks, when you don't forgive someone, you bind yourself. When you say, I'm not going to forget that person, I don't care what it is, you just bound yourself from heaven. The Bible says when you pray, forgive. If you don't forgive, everyone, everything, verbally say it. Now, now listen, this, I want to explain. Memories are not unforgiveness. I have a lot of bad memories people did to me, but I choose to let, not let them dwell in my head. That's not unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is when you, every time you see him, you choose to do something at him. Unforgiveness is not releasing them. So even if you have somebody that's hurt you in your past, you say, Father, help me to release them so it's not held against me. Doesn't mean you won't have memories anymore, but those, that's not unforgiveness. It's just memories. 
Cast them down. So if you've forgiven somebody and you see them, don't run away from them. Run right up to them. Ask them how Jesus is doing. You see, I always confront what tries to confront me. When fear knocks at your door, faith answers there's no one there. Hi, faith. Satan, false evidence appearing as real. Fear, false evidence appearing as real. But you have someone greater in you. All right, let's finish with you. Say amen. So when you have unforgiveness, you've lost. You hold on to unforgiveness, you will not go to heaven. Because you seal yourself from being raptured. So always forgive, even if it's hard. Say with your mouth, believe in your heart, Lord, I forgive them, and then move on. My dad used to say, son, when you get bit by the dog, shame on the dog. But if you go riding your bike again and get bit again, shame on you. Dumb, dumb. Of course, that was my unsaved father. Now he's saved. He would never say that to me. He says, hey, son, where are you going riding today? <laughs> Stay away from the dog. All right, so let's move on. Are you with me? All right, let's finish up with his points. The purpose of the armor, I want to stay a little more time on this. I'm going to do a series on the light being the light of man. The life being the light of man. But on this, the purpose of the armor, everyone say purpose. purpose. How many here know Satan does not like you ripping at his kingdom? So don't forget, he, he counterattacks. Now, he can't counterattack you if you've got your armor on. That's why the armor. Because even if you're asleep at night, you're covered. Folks, somebody's ever had a bad dream at night. And if you're still having them, you miss one thing. You go, Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus over my dreams, over my body. Let me be refreshed. Let me be, be rejuvenated. You might not be, remember all these words. Just get the blood of Jesus over your mind so that I have a sweet sleep. Boom, that seals them off because Satan's a real turkey. He'll come in your bewitching hour and get into your subconscious and give you a bad dream. And go, blah, 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 blah. what a toughie has to attack you when you're asleep. So cover your sleep. Say amen. Be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Okay, finally, brethren, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Everyone say finally. finally. This word means in the Greek. For the rest of you that got all that together, for the rest of you that understand how to walk with God, finally, what I have to tell you now is very, very important. That's what that finally means. Say amen. I'm mess still messing with my pants. Suspenders. If anybody wants to give me suspenders, get me something that looks cool. I don't want to be Steve Urkel, okay? All right. So finally, my brethren, be strong where? Be strong in the Lord. God wants you to be in walking with God and in the power of his what? That means that you are like dynamite to Satan. Be strong in the Lord. Outside the Lord, you're a wimp. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's what leads us. God's power leads us. Why? Because to drive us through life, because of the enemy, it takes the life of God to drive us through the life and the word of God. Can you say amen? Who's driving your life? Are you still sitting at the wheel? Let's go on. Put on the whole armor of God. How much? that you may be able to stand against the wiles, tricks, and cunning craftiness of the devil. For we do not wrestle against human beings, flesh and blood. I don't care how mad you get at your neighbor, some spirit behind him caused him to do it. You're fighting the spirit and not the person. Because Satan, if he can get you to fight against a person, he'll suck the energy out of you. But if you can say, no, I, I bind up that spirit behind that person. 
causing them to say that, causing them to do those things. And I render you ineffective, and I cast you into the dry places, and I forbid you to return. Woo, you're taking charge. Yeah. You can do it, because you have the one who's done it all in you. He's already won the victory. He's already seated at the right hand of the Father. He's already redeemed you, sealed you, blessed you, covered you. Can you say amen? And now we're looking at this armor. And it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That's the Greek word archon. That's where we get the archangels, which were serpent angels. They were seraphim and cherubim, and if you read the understanding of it, there were fiery serpent angels that God had made to serve him. Now we know Lucifer and his bunch fell, okay? That's why you see in Genesis 3, the serpent was more cunning than all the other beasts of the field, because he wasn't a beast of the field. He was a fallen angel. And the reason why I use the term serpent, because that's what they look like. Don't look at me in that tonal voice. I'm, I'm tired of the church giving mamby-pamby baby, baby winged angels to fly around in the nursery, and then you got this big devil that looks like going to devour everybody. Your angels are bigger, stronger. You have many more of them. The problem is we have an unrenewed mind, and we're religious in our thinking, so we're not really working with the program as good as we should, but we want to. Say amen, and the Lord teach us how to do that. The Bible says by us speaking the word, the angels go to work. By us speaking our doubts and our negative, we bind our angels. We'll get to that some other sermon. You don't want to bind your angels. They're the ones that minister to you for God. All right, let's go on. So we wrestle against principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, because we are in this problem, take up the whole armor of God. How do we do that, Pastor Terry? Two-thirds of the church still don't know how to do that. I used to think I put on the helmet, get to adjusting my belt, <laughs> I need to, you know, press play all right, just make sure I'm right with God. And I'd go through that, and God said one day to me, he loves saying this to me, Kerry, what are you doing? He says, I'm putting on the armor. He says, you don't put it on. It's spiritual. I put it on you. What you do is you bring yourself to me. The way you put on the armor is you bring yourself to me. You bring yourself to me. I put it on you. If you don't come to the throne dressing room, then you will not be clothed. Man, and you know what he closes with? First we're cleansed. Then we're washed in the blood. Then we're robed of righteous Christ's robes are placed on us. Then the undergarment for the armor, which is light. And then God just sits Jesus down around us. You are totally equipped. Don't open your mouth and tell anything different. Just walk on, confident, and be strong. Somebody says something weird to you, just smile at them, because God will give you what to say. Now, what you need to know is this armor, the reason why we describe the helmet, the breastplate, is this, all these pieces, everyone say all pieces of the armor, is Jesus. So the helmet of salvation is the mind of Christ, for we have the mind of Christ. So when the armor's on, your head does not think negative thoughts. When you go to your throne and you meet with God and he puts that on you, your head is just in tune. How many has witnessed that? And then it says your belt of truth. It says belt of truth first. Who's the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus belts your life together. If you don't put him first, he won't hold your armor on. You can joke that way. Uh, righteousness. Breastplate of righteousness. Who's the righteousness of God? Jesus. And who lives in us? 
So the breastplate means project the righteousness of God out as excellence. Don't run around and brag how good you are. Let the excellence of God and what you do and say be your righteousness. Amen. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Gospel is the word of God. Keep your feet ready to share some good news with somebody. If nothing else, you might just say, hey, I like your hair. Some kind of encouraging word, the word's full. The world is full of negativity. Are you with me? Taking the shield of faith, wherewith you can quench all. Who is our shield? Who is our buckler? Jesus. And I was taught in Bible college, you take the shield of faith, and you try to hide behind it. And it's not complete. So don't turn your back on the enemy because you're going to stick a little zap and arrow in your rear end. That's what I was taught in Bible college. This is religion. When God puts Jesus down on us, it's covering us 360. There's no opening. There's no holes. First thing that God, the, the enemy knows this. As long as you got God on, you're, the armor on. As long as you got God on, he can't touch you. So he goes about to try to pull you out of that place. Hey, you dummy. Remember what your mother said. You know, hey, remember what your kids are doing. Hey, dummy, come on out of your armor. I know you're in there. Sin's going, I know you're in there. I can't touch you unless you get out of there. That's exactly what he's doing. So he finds something in your life that you're kind of wondering about and everything, and he begins to just lace it, hoping that you're going to walk out. This is not faith. I'm not walking in faith. Hello? Come on now. I hope you are enjoying this on the camera. Oh, Lord, help me. But that's where a lot of the churches, come on, you know it. Yeah, yeah. You ask him this now. Come on, bring him here. Yeah. Say, I want you to sit in the front pew and listen to this man for three weeks. Just three weeks, and then let's have a review and find out how much you learned. Yeah. Let's do an experiment. Let's get these people where they need to hear the word. And this, instead of this namby pamby, hold on till the end. Do you ever see that little poster with the cats holding on like this? Yeah. Think about that. How long do you think that cat can hold on? This is the natural Christian that thinks they need to hold on. Folks, wrap Jesus around you. Let him hold on to you. Stop holding on. Surrender. Come on, don't get me out of me. I'm, I'm trying to tell you the simplicity, how Satan twists the simplicity of the gospel. Paul writes, I am so amazed that you're so soon removed from the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ into another gospel, which is not another, though some trouble you. We have that today. In fact, we're teaching on the book of Galatians Wednesdays. Please read there. Go out of your way to get a ride or something. Okay, finishing. So it goes on, it says, take up the whole armor of God. We know by meeting God, God puts it on us, that you may be able to stand in the evil day. What's the evil day? Every day. Every day when you meet with God, he puts the armor on you. That armor functions for you. I'll say it again. That armor functions for you. Stop trying to use the armor. Let the armor lead you. Who's the armor? Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. We follow the shepherd, don't we? We don't get out in front of him. We don't wander around having him leave the rest and follow us because we're such ding-dongs. Come on. God doesn't want us to be a Christian ding-dong. Ding-dong. I think it's sometimes a gong show. Oh, God, help me. And God said, oh, I wish you'd get up on faith and on the word because I can't do anything else. I certainly can't answer all your unbelief. 
I need you to get up on faith, get on the word, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Okay, can you do that, Carrie? Yes, Lord. And finishing. It goes on further. And it says, and it just lists, lists, it says, gird your waist with truth, having the breastplate of righteousness, and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. I got an illustration God gave me that I want to do in a couple of weeks on the armor. But you see, we have a sword of the Spirit. Say amen. It's the Word of God, right? Now, isn't the Word in Jesus the same? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word became flesh. So Jesus and the Word are the same. So when you speak the Word from your spirit, not off the head, but from your inner man, your core, it becomes light. And what does Satan run from? What heals sickness? What delivers from disease? What are you full of? So learn to direct light from your lips. This is the sword of the spirit. Hello? Now, if I shut all, all, all lights off in this room, could, you couldn't see anybody. And I had a big boomer flashlight. And you imagine the enemies in the corner and I say, Father, in the name of Jesus, and boom, that light comes on and that corner is liberated. That's who you are. The light that you have emanating is not seeable unless God opens your mind to it. My mic's still going? Okay, good. I want to make sure sometimes the batteries cease. And when that power is going like that, Satan sees it and flees. The problem is the church is not being taught that. Come on now, when's the last time you went to church and somebody told you this? And yet it's all in the scripture. Who do you think has been trying to hide things from the church? Right, so we don't, we're not going to go on what he does. We're going to go after God, say amen. We're going after revival. We're going after restoration. We're going after changing the world. We're going after a frame in our life. That's what we're going after. Not to sit around and wait till we die. <coughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Uh -huh. Ah, uh -huh. man. Yeah. Let's try to finish this thing. <sighs> all right. Then the Bible says, after all of those armors, it says, praying always. How often? Always. The Bible says, to be in a state of prayer is what it means. So if you run up against something, you pray about it right away. You bring the light into it. Yeah. Don't, okay, somebody calls you, hey, Carrie, we got somebody real sick in our congregation. Would you start praying? Yep, I'll tell the group and we'll get after it. First thing I do is I start praying right away. Then I get it on the, the team and get everybody else praying. You see, we change things. Think about prayer, how powerful prayer it really is. How did your life change? You prayed. You said, Father, I believe in my heart, and I confess with my, uh, my lips, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. That was your prayer of change. A couple of things. The purpose of the whole armor of God is to seal you from Satan's touch, Satan's influence. Hello? But because we have our own choice and will, we don't always stay within that protection. And that's where the trouble often happens with Christians. You got somebody who compromises. I love God. I'm, they'll come, their life has fallen apart, so they'll come to you. Now, I'm not talking about anybody here, just through the years. And they'll say, oh God, I want you to pray and everything like that. But they won't clean their life up. They still drink, they still party, but they want to be delivered. But they don't know what they're doing, you see, because it's not really what goes in us that defiles us. It's what we allow to affect us and what comes out of us. So a person can actually reinfect themselves. 
by, by going through things that God is saying, okay, now, Carrie, I want you to clean that up, and I'm going to help you to do it. Then say, okay, Lord, you're going to have to help, because, Lord, I spent a weakness in me. Confess your faults one to another, pray for one another, be healed. But if we can't do that with God, then you're going to try to hide what flaws we have. Please don't do that. We all have flaws. I don't try to hide them. I say, God, would you put your finger on some flaws that I can't see about me? I'd rather have you help me with them than have other people point them out. <laughs> don't look at me in that tone of voice. Hello. And we're not supposed to be pointing out faults anyway. But listen, don't get down on yourself. You've got a lot of nasty stuff still floating around your head. Don't look at me as you're a saint. You do. And so to get rid of that, we've got to keep the washing going. Can you say amen? Folks, what's the one thing? Ladies, what's the one thing? Maybe, maybe guys too. What's the one thing you keep having to do every week? Laundry! Don't forget, Christian. Every day you get washed, you get cleansed, so that you're fresh and you grow up out of yourself and the limits of your flesh. All right, finishing. Romans 13, verse 11 through 14, very familiar. We are in the last days, do you agree? Yes. And we need to really be able to know how to walk with God with his help. Can you agree? Yes. So let's look at this. I'm going to slow it down. In verse 11, he, uh, Romans 13 says, and do this. And what? Yes. Doing the word and not hearing only. How do we get the foundation on our feet? Hear and do. Hear and do. You have a Jesus rock foundation under your feet wherever you go. Hearing and doing. All right. And it says, and do this knowing the time. What time is it? Look around you. How much are you aware of what's going, what's failing? Don't let it affect you, but be aware of the time. Listen, if you're outside in your underwear because you're not aware you didn't put your pants on or whatever, somebody has to let you know. The Christians have been running through the world with no clothing of Jesus on, trying to convince people in the natural to receive Jesus. It doesn't work. You need to receive and release God on them. I always go for the heart, not the head. I'm talking to somebody, I go for the heart, not the head. Yeah, 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 yeah. But how come you're so broken and lonely in your heart? How come the other night you were crying? I go for the heart, not the head. Let's go on. And do this now knowing the time to wake out of sleep. What is people doing? God is waking the church up. They've been sleeping. Please, I'm not picking on you. They've been asleep, not knowing what the will of the Lord is. Well, now it's waking up. We're having a revival. God is restoring things. But wake out of sleep, for the now our salvation is even nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Get your flesh in order. Can you say amen? Stop walking around like a bobo or a bimbo or whatever. Hello? Yes. Stop trying to convince people that you're a good Christian when they can see your flesh stinking on the, on the stick. Hello? We know better. I mean, listen, I knew a guy. When I, I loved him. His name, I, we nicknamed him Gummer. He was a drummer like me, so he played a lot of the bands that I played because co my cousin would hire me out in bands. So I played with Ernest Tubb, Wheeling Jennings. I played with uh, Lefty Frizzell. A lot of these bands I never heard of, but they're famous because I knew how to play. So he put me in this and stuff. And I had this friend named Gummer. And he got gloriously saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, but nobody, he never kept on coming to church. So he had all of his understanding. So one day I was down by Casey's Caboose down in Sumner, I don't know if you know that, 
And he come out and he was drunk, staggering around. Now the Bible says I'm not to condemn anybody like that, but rather to pray for them. Easy to say, hey, what are you doing, you sinner? That's not what God wanted me to do. And God says, I want you to look. So he came out, and when he came out, he was just really, really, really stoned. He's on on to be with the Lord, so I'm not in trouble. And this kid in the skateboard came flying down the sidewalk, and he hit the curb, and he fell and skinned up his face and whacked his arm. And here, my, my friend, who loves Jesus, but he's right now intoxicated, comes down, he goes, oh! drunk and everything, lays his hand on the kid, the kid gets healed instantly. Awesome. And you might say, what does that teach us? That teaches that God has to work some way and he'll use any donkey. Yeah. So don't get to thinking you're just all that. Yeah. And I said to God, Lord, that just blows my, my, my theory about God. How can you? He says, I use all kinds of people, son. He says, he does not love me. He just made a big mistake, and you've seen it. Why react to that person as that's his lifestyle, but rejoice in me for a healing the kid? Really taught me a lesson there. And I thought, how many people have come to church drunk and broken and left safe? How many times have we judged people and not mean to that maybe had slipped or something broke? I remember one more story, okay? I lost my first child. It wasn't formed right in the, in the mother's womb. It's in my previous marriage. And so I lost a child, and the devil just sat on my head. He says, why don't you go out and get drunk and feel sorry for yourself? I mean, it's literally... I thought, Lord, you don't want me to do that. And God says, I know a place for you to go. And he showed me there's somebody in Prairie Ridge that needed my help. Right there. In my sorrow and everything. So I didn't drink or anything, but I went up to this person. What had happened to this kid is he was raped by some homosexuals. And he was ready to kill himself. And God had me come right up, stop at the house, go in and says, Sam... God sent me. He just fell down and asked God to forgive him. I took the gun away from him. Now, I could have sat in my sorrow and felt sorry for myself and lost that opportunity for somebody's soul. Me, 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 me. But God says, no, son, you obeyed me, and I will bless you for that obedience beyond what you can imagine. So we try to imagine what God's going to bless us with. Please don't do that, because you're limiting him. <laughs> ah. So listen, let us walk properly. As in the day, not in rivalness, not in drunkenness, not in lewdness, not in lust, not in strife or envy, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for your flesh. Where do we go to meet him? Where do we go to get dressed? Where do we go to get blessed? We go into the world with the rest. For we are blessed with Christ, and we are to reign in life with him. If you got something out of that this morning, would you give the Lord a praise? <laughs> Amen, you guys.